Well, the Russians have made a laughing stock of us. First they forced us to make a drunken, lecherous man Secretary of State for Defence, or war, as it used to be called, when John Profumo held the august office. At least we were more honest about job titles back then. John Profumo had to resign as Secretary of State for War in 1963 when it was found that he had not only been conducting an affair with what was quaintly called a call girl in those days, but had lied about it to the Prime Minister and to the House of Commons, which in those days was a fate from which no one could escape. Now, the Secretary of State for Defence, a Dundonian, though you would never tell it from his accent, has had to either resign or be sacked, no one knows quite which, as a result of allegations which, on the face of it, seem, well, mild compared with some of the other allegations that are now doing the rounds. Let's see what we have in the public domain. First of all, he is said to, well, I think there's no doubt about it, put his hand on the knee of the redoubtable Julia Hartley Brewer. She says she was not in the least upset or offended by it and treated it with the contempt that it deserved by threatening to punch him in the face if he did it again. The second charge is that Andrea Leadsom, the one-time Conservative leadership contender, complained in a meeting that her hands were cold and the Secretary of State for War said he knew where she could put them if she wanted to warm them up. Vile, foul, infantile, probably drunken, about which more later, but hardly the stuff that sees the Secretary of State for War resigning, so maybe there's more to it. Maybe the Sunday papers, as we used to call them, will bring further elucidation. Certainly on the spreadsheet, and I can't go into for legal reasons, the spreadsheet I have before me, though I will selectively and anonymously quote from it, there are more unresolved mysteries about the conduct of the Secretary of State for War, Mr. Michael Fallon, as was. Profumo was replaced by a non-entity, and then that non-entity was replaced with a further non-entity. And then the Conservatives lost office. Harold Wilson whipped them in 1964. And I have never seen a government dead on its feet, like the government I'm currently watching. Despite the efforts of the mainstream media to move this story into an anti-Corbyn, anti-Labour story, even though the allegations which have to be and are being resolutely inquired into, and in one case, the most serious case, a charge of rape and a subsequent cover-up is now under legal uh, hands in the form of a Queen's Council who is looking into the matter. But the story, the big story, is the spreadsheet and the horrifying tales about Conservative MPs and ministers and Cabinet ministers that are rolled out there. Now, I have a number of questions about it. First of all, whose spreadsheet is it? Don't tell me it came from the WHIP's office because they have your figurative little black book that they have from time immemorial recorded in all the peccadillos and all the, uh, how shall I put it, misdeeds of members of parliament. Not so those misdeeds can be investigated and prosecuted, but so those misdeeds can be used for political blackmail purposes to force members of parliament into lobbies 
they might not otherwise have wanted to go into, to promote people and to demote people. These acts of skullduggery were prevalent in the near 30 years that I spent in the House of Commons, and they were as prevalent in the Labour Whip's office as they were in the Conservative. But as it's turned out, the non-entity, the mediocrity, who has risen without trace and has taken the job of the Secretary of State for War was the Chief Whip. He's never held any other office, not even parliamentary undersecretary for paper clips in the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries. He has never held a ministerial position, and now his finger is on the button. Yes, the nuclear button. He is the Secretary of State for War, though nobody, including me, had ever heard of him before he was given that job. And Tory MPs are reportedly furious, and the air was blue, if you'll forgive the pun, in the members' tea room, as members of Parliament, Conservative MPs, were spitting blood about the fact that Fallon was forced out by a report from the Chief Whip. And the Chief Whip then got Fallon's job. That's why I say the Russians must be laughing, mustn't they? Because, of course, the Russians are involved in everything. As I said, having forced us to have a drunken lecture as the Secretary of State for Defence, they've now forced us to get rid of him and replace him by a complete non-entity who doesn't even fill the rather cheap suit that he habitually wears, let alone the uniform of the Commander-in-Chief of Britain's Armed Forces. But there are other things in the spreadsheet. One Conservative MP, an honourable and gallant gentleman, as we would have been forced to call him, an honourable and gallant Member of Parliament, is said in the spreadsheet by whoever wrote it to be, and I quote, perpetually intoxicated and very offensive in the company of women. Now, as it happens, I know nothing about the second allegation. But the first allegation I can testify to. The person in question is perpetually intoxicated. So what is he an MP for? Why is he an MP? Why is someone a member of parliament who is perpetually intoxicated? Not least because it's the only workplace in the land where you can get as stupid drunk as you like at 1970s prices, subsidised by the taxpayer in any one of the 19 bars in the House, Houses of Parliament. 19 bars. Satanic, some of them are. I've only walked past them, never been in them. But when the door swings open at the stranger's bar on the terrace corridor, my God, the din and the smell and the sight of staggering MPs. It's a staggering sight because they are staggering up to the lobbies to vote on they know not what, as told by the whips so to do. Now, I've been running this little campaign for some weeks before all this uh, broke. It's simply intolerable that not only can you, and if you want to be clubbable, must you, hang out in these bars, and you don't go far in Parliament if you don't, hang out in these bars all day, all night, as late as you like. It never closes as long as there are members drinking. It's not only intolerable that this should happen in a workplace. It's not only intolerable that the public should be subsidising the prices in these satanic holes, these hovels, these black holes of Calcutta, much worse than the black hole of Calcutta. Some of them smell and look to me. What is even more intolerable is that the honourable members, as we must call them, behave so badly. It's the house of cads. 
Never mind the House of Cads or the House of Cards. It's like an episode of Shameless. That's the kind of impression that the British public are now getting about Parliament. It's time to cleanse this Augean stable. In fact, it's time to close it down. As I have been saying for some years, Parliament should be turned into a museum and Parliament should be relocated to the north, perhaps to Leeds, perhaps to Manchester, but relocated to the north with a very wide-ranging set of changes to how it operates and how its members are supposed to behave. We'll be talking a lot about the House of Cads, I have no doubt, but we mustn't lose sight of the greatest cad of them all, the President of the United States of America. No sooner had yet another ISIS fanatic mowed down, mass murdered in Manhattan, and Trump, who hadn't had a word to say about the shooting of six hundred people in Las Vegas just a couple of weeks ago. And what happened to that story, by the way? How come we still know nothing about that story? Not a word about the 600 in Las Vegas, but he moved into perpetual motion on the subject of what happened in Manhattan, doubling down on his vile crusade, yes, crusade, against the Two billion Muslims in the world. Absolutely inanely talking about his list of banned countries from which the United States would take no immigrants, even visitors. Oblivious, it would appear, to the fact that Uzbekistan isn't on his list. Wasn't on his list, isn't on his list despite the fact that that's where this particular mass murderer allegedly came from. And on the subject of allegedly, when Donald Trump called on Twitter for the death penalty for this murderer, he guaranteed that the murderer cannot now get the death penalty because his trial has been irre irredeemably prejudiced by the highest office holder in the country. And then he threatened to send this murderer to Guantanamo Bay, the place that he had said should be closed down because it was an affront to America's sense of decency and justice. So under Obama it needed to be closed down. Under Trump, we should still be sending people there for presumably the kind of torture for which it has become infamous. And then, of course, his campaign manager is facing 12 charges. His deputy campaign manager is facing 12 charges. His policy advisor has pleaded guilty to making false statements to the FBI. Russia Gate appears to be deepening. And Trump appears to be in deeper and deeper trouble. Which is why, of course, habitually, he likes to chuck it around to ask you, please, look over there. Look what's happening over there, rather than look at what's happening in his case. So, all of these, with expert witnesses and guests, will be our fare for the next two hours and 40 minutes on the mother of all talk shows.